how can the same pill affect people in completely different ways? One person takes a medication for blood pressure and immediately after they take that medication almost, they feel lightheaded. They can notice their blood pressure coming, coming down. And then another person takes the exact same pill, the exact same dose, the exact same way, and they come back and they're like, I don't feel anything. And also my blood pressure is not going down. The difference is, of course, potentially wrapped up in absorption, which we talked about in the last video. So go back and watch that one first if you haven't watched that one yet. But if it's not an absorption issue, it could be the step after that, which is when the drug actually gets into your bloodstream. And that step is called distribution. The important thing that I want to draw here and, and convey to you guys is that there are multiple different steps in the process from drug going from your hand into your body and different things that can be affected in each of those steps along the way. So we already talked about absorption. Here we're going to talk about distribution. My name is Takova Wallace Gay. I'm the community's pharmacist. And my goal here on this channel is to take you from overwhelm to empowerment, from confusion to clarity when it comes to your medications. And because this is National Pharmacist Month, I really want to start with the basics of how medications work in the body anyway. So things that we learn in pharmacy school, I'm going to break it down and give it to you right here. So again, I already talked about absorption today. In this video, we're going to talk about distribution and then we'll talk about metabolism in the next video and then we'll talk about excretion, how it gets out of the body in the final video in our series here. So let's talk about distribution. Now, if absorption is kind of that first plank, the first step, it's got to get into your bloodstream and we don't want to mess up things that can affect it getting into your bloodstream. It already, medications for the most part, if they're taken orally, they're not getting 100% in your bloodstream anyway. The only way to do that is IV. But once we do get the amount of drug that we need into the bloodstream, it's got to be distributed throughout the body. And that's where this step comes in. Drugs are going to move through your bloodstream and they may stay in the bloodstream. Some medications do. Other medications may move into your fat. Other me medications may cross into your brain. And depending on the drug, all of those things can make the difference. Some medications do all of those things. So I really just want to break down what distribution is first. So just to kind of put it simply, it's how blood moves from your bloodstream into the rest of your body. So absorption is how it gets into the bloodstream and distribution is how it moves, moves from the bloodstream into the rest of your body's tissues. And those tissues can be anything, your liver tissue, your kidney, your muscles, all of the tissues of your body. So we really think about the bloodstream of the body like a highway. Once the drug is on that highway, like where does it exit? Is it going to exit here to the muscles? Is it going to exit here to the fat? Is it going to exit to the brain? Or maybe it's just going to stay the course and continue circulating in the blood. That is all wrapped up in distribution. So there are some things that can, that are associated with distribution that I want to kind of lay out here as a foundation. One of those things is called plasma protein binding. All that means is that some drugs kind of hit your ride, if you will, on proteins that are in our blood. One of the main proteins in our blood is called albumin or albumin, depending on where you're from and how you pronounce it. And albumin is in the blood. So drugs can bind to that. And some drugs are highly protein bound, which means when you take them and they get to the bloodstream, they're all hitching a ride. Like a lot of that drug is binding to the protein. Some drugs are not highly protein bound, which means a little bit of it binds, but the rest of it is still free, inactive, and able to go wherever it wants to go. A nice example of this is a medication called warfarin, or the brand name for warfarin is Coumadin. And Coumadin is used for preventing you from having blood clots. So Coumadin specifically is one of those that, that is highly protein bound, but if another drug comes in, and bumps it off of that protein, then suddenly you can have way too much coumadin or warfarin in your system, which raises your risk of using that medication to keep you from clotting. Now, if we've been giving you a certain dose, you've been binding it, a lot of that dose, you've been binding, let's just say, 50% of that dose to protein, and the other 50% of that dose has been still active and free and helping prevent you from having a clot, and then this other medication comes in that's also highly protein bound and it's like scoot over. I need some space too. And it bumps some of that warfarin off of those proteins. Now you went from having 50% free to having 60% free. 
you've got more drug working in your system and not being bound to the protein. And that's going to increase your risk of having a bleed because now, you know, what one dose was doing to prevent you from having a bleed is now doing that job even more because a drug is bumping part of it off of the protein. So hopefully that makes sense. But all of that to say some drugs are tightly or highly bound to proteins. And when the drug is bound to a protein like albumin, that means it's it's chilling. It's not free to go off and do its job. Now, they don't stay bound forever, but they do stay bound for a period of time. And then they start to become free and continue on to do its job. And then you have to redose and kind of start that process all over again. Another thing that affects distribution is what we call volume of distribution. And this is just a fancy way of saying, is the drug a lover of water or is the drug a lover of fat? If the drug is a lover of water, then it's going to have a lower volume of distribution. That means it's going to stay in the bloodstream. It's not going to distribute throughout the body as much. If it is a lover of fat, then it's not going to want to stay in the bloodstream because there's a lot of water in the blood. It's going to want to go and find fat throughout the body. And so that drug is going to hide in highly fatty parts of the body, which means it can maybe linger for a while and stay in the body a little bit longer because it's been distributed to fatty tissues and just kind of stays there. Um, So these are medications like benzodiazepines or benzo. So that's like Xanax. Those medications are very fat loving. Uh, Another medication called amiodarone, which is used for, for heart conditions is also one that kind of soaks into fatty tissue and stays in the body quite a bit of time just because it has distributed to those tissues. So again, volume of distribution, that just depends on if that drug is one that is designed to be water-loving or fat-loving. And if it is water-loving, it's going to want to stay in the bloodstream and travel in that way. Now, some of it will distribute because, you know, nothing is 100% one way or the other. So some of it will still distribute, but for the most part, it's going to stay in the bloodstream. And if it's something that is fat loving, then it will distribute to the tissues a lot wider. And some drugs have really high volumes of distribution. Some drugs have low volumes of distribution, but it's a spectrum. Most medications kind of fall somewhere on that spectrum, although there are a few that are very very highly volume or have very high volume of distributions and there are some that have very low volume of distribution Um, and that can be good or bad depending on what we're treating and then we have something that we think about like tissue barriers that can be something that affects distribution so some tissues are really easy to get into like the muscle Others are really guarded, like the brain. There's a barrier, an actual, what we call the blood-brain barrier, which is kind of like TSA. It prevents things from getting through, um, which we need. We don't want a whole bunch of stuff crossing into our our brain. Um, So certain antibiotics, for example, that's why they may not work as well for meningitis because we can't get them into the brain stem where they need to be. And we know the ones that we can or we might have to inject the medication straight to the source and kind of keeping with the antibiotic route. There are certain antibiotics that don't get into the bone because the bone is really hard to get into. So if you have an infection of the bone, we know that we have to use this other drug that we formulated or that is formulated and actually can get into the bone a lot easier. So thinking about the just the barriers in the body that already exist. And which tissues are easy to get into, like the muscle, and which tissues are difficult to get into, like the brain. And then I think about some of these special situations like pregnancy. Some drugs cross the placenta and some drugs do not. And just because a medication crosses the placenta doesn't mean that it's going to be harmful for the baby because many medications are not. Um, But it is something to be cognizant of that the placenta is one of those barriers, but kind of like the muscle, a lot of things can cross the placenta. And then we've got like during breastfeeding, crossing into breast milk. Same thing, like a lot of medications can cross into breast milk. Some things that this depends on is like the size of the molecule. So how big the drug chemical molecule is. And sometimes it depends on how fat loving or water loving the drug is. Um, And then we've got other things like the uh, medical conditions or disease states. So if someone has liver disease or kidney disease, or if they have low protein in the blood, 
and you've got a drug that's highly protein bound, but it doesn't have a lot of protein around to bind to, things like that can affect distribution and, and how widely distributed a drug is in the body. I gave you the example um, a little bit about antibiotics and bone infection. So we sometimes struggle with antibiotics because, of course, not every antibiotic is going to distribute into the bone very well. So I mentioned that. You know, we get very picky about which drug we use in that situation because we know that there are some very specific ones that can penetrate into the into the bone, whereas most of the other ones cannot. And then another situation that I hear and see come up a lot has to do with weight. So I already mentioned that some medications are fat loving. So if someone has a lot more fat tissue and that drug is being distributed into the fat and staying there, but we need that drug to be in the bloodstream so that it can go throughout the body somewhere else to do work, they may need a higher dose. We may need to like overcompensate so that a lot of the drug is going to distribute to the fatty tissue area, but a lot of it will still stay around and longer in the bloodstream in order to do another job. And then we think about either older patients. It's not always older patients, but sometimes older patients who do have lower albumin protein levels just floating around in their bloodstream. So that, again, means that there's more free drugs floating if there are drugs that want to be bound to that protein, but that protein's not around. And so if that's the case, we may need to give those older adults a lower dose of a medication because they don't have as much protein for the drug to bind to. And if we give them the same dose that we would have given them when their protein levels were higher, that's going to increase their risk of side effects um, and things like that, even though they're on what we would normally consider a normal dose. They might still need a lower dose of that. So I want you to think about things like if, you know, if a, people sometimes think if a, if a medication is in your blood, that it's working. And that's not always the case because some drugs can be in your blood, but they are not distributing to the right tissues that they need to go to to do the job, which means you won't feel the effects of that drug. So everyone, you know, needs to think about whether or not they're on a medication that requires a higher volume of distribution in order to do its job. And that's something that, you know, we can talk to your provider about. And you can always ask on the front end, like, I'm a skinnier person or I'm a heavier person. Like, is that going to affect how this medication is distributed throughout my body? And if so, do we need to adjust my dose for that? And sometimes if you're just starting a medication, we start you on the initial dose that we've seen work in most people. But if you find that it's working too much or not working enough, it could mean that we need to adjust the dose for a number of different factors. There's also a myth that everybody needs the same dose. Just because somebody needs a, a higher dose than you doesn't mean that like they're worse off in their condition than you are. It could just mean that you have distribution differences. It could be weight. It could be like just internal muscle fat or uh, tissue fat, excuse me. It could be protein levels. So one dose for one person might be a little bit lower than the next person, but they may have the same level of like control of their medical condition. So it could just mean that you're distributing things a little bit different. You know, with all that, I'll, I'll wrap it up here. Distribution kind of goes into a lot of different areas of my bridge framework. Um, my bridge framework being build your med map, review regularly, integrate into lifestyle, develop questions, guide your team, and empower action. But it most it most closely resonates with the R, which is review your med list. So are your meds working right for your body? Do you have kidney disease or liver issues or have you had any changes in your weight that might affect how the drugs are being distributed? When you review your medications, this is the perfect place to speak with your healthcare clinician and ask them, how is this medication affecting my body? Where does this drug need to go in order to do its job? Does it need to stay in the bloodstream? Does it need to distribute to muscles? And a big one that I hear stories about are statins. And I'll do a whole separate video on statins because you know, multiple statins have different levels of water versus fat-loving capabilities, which means they distribute differently. And someone may have an issue on one and not have an issue if we switch them to just a different one, a different statin drug. So I think just asking, how does my body affect where this drug goes? And that would play into like your weight, your protein, all of those things. And because 
the way your body stores or moves medications can be very key to why you might be feeling side effects or why you're not getting results. This question, when it comes to developing questions, how this medication works for me, specifically for my body, is a really important one to ask. So the takeaway is absorption gets the drug into your bloodstream. Distribution decides where it actually goes. And that is really where the real story begins because No matter if you absorb a lot of the medication or a little of it, it still needs to go where you want it to go to do the job. So next time we'll talk about metabolism, which is how your liver transforms the drug into something that is usable or sometimes something that's toxic. If you're looking for a way to manage your medications to get everything in one place, please download my free medication mind map guide. This helps you organize all of the different aspects of a medication that you need to know, and it helps you to start developing questions that are important about each of your medications so that you can feel more clear, more clarified when it comes to what these medications are doing for you and what are all the things you need to think about when it comes to taking your medications. So you can fill this med map out. It's a starter guide starting with just one medication. You can really do it in about five minutes, but definitely less than 30 minutes to map out one of your prescriptions. So hopefully this video was helpful for you. If, if you liked it, please uh, give me a thumbs up, subscribe. Um, and don't just take your medications, y'all. Make sure you understand them. And stay tuned for the next video on metabolism.